Well, it's good to be back with you. Thank you for inviting me back to, to share with you. Uh, whoever picked the music, thank you. That was great songs, all of them. Uh, the one that you said about Christmas was a new one to me, but uh, the words are very meaningful, so thank you. Thank you for those songs. I want to share some, a portion of scripture from a larger story. Now, we could have read the whole chapter of Luke 24, but that would be a long time. And so I picked just a few verses that I want to talk about having our eyes wide open. And you already heard songs, and you will be singing a song about that a little later as well. Luke 24, verses 28 to 35. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. We ask God's blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Little Bobby was walking down the street calling out, Baptist puppies for sale. Baptist puppies for sale. The next week, Bobby walked down the street calling out, Mennonite puppies for sale. Mennonite puppies for sale. His neighbor, Mr. Jones, stopped him and asked, Bobby, last week you were selling Baptist puppies. Now this week you're selling Mennonite puppies. What's going on? Well, Mr. Jones, Bobby said, this week their eyes are open. In today's scripture, we have two people walking the road to Emmaus, a seven-mile trip from Jerusalem. It's that day that we call Resurrection Day, but they're sad. They're confused. They're wondering about the events of this past couple days. Now, these two have been called followers of Jesus by commentators. Perhaps two of the many who followed Jesus outside of those 12 closest disciples. Now, we don't know, or Luke doesn't tell us, how much of the events of the past couple days they actually saw in person. But they knew that Jesus, the one they had followed, had died on a Roman cross, was buried, but now there are stories, there's rumors about Jesus being alive. As they walk this road, they're joined by someone, they don't recognize him at first, but they tell him what happened to Jesus and these rumors they've heard about resurrection. Their physical blindness to who was walking with them reflected I think there's spiritual blindness to the events of the day, to reality, to the resurrection of Jesus. This man walking with them said, well, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken about the Messiah. To fully understand their lack of recognition of Jesus walking with them that day, I think of the words that Michael Card wrote in his commentary on Luke. He said this, and I quote, No one was expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. No one. End quote. Picture yourself on that road that day. Would you have been expecting a dead person to come to life? When Luke described 
the reaction of the disciples when the women came back to them and said, look, we've been to the tomb. There was an angel, and the angel told us Jesus was not there, but was alive. The disciples thought they were delirious. That's the word that Luke uses, delirious, out of their mind, not facing reality of the death of Jesus. These two walking on the road didn't realize their blindness their, in their grief and their confusion about what had happened. And Jesus, walking with them, explains to them all that Scripture said about the Messiah and how this was part of what God's plan was, that the, that the Messiah would die, be buried, but rise again. And though their hearts burned, they said, they still didn't recognize Jesus. Their eyes were still not open. I mean, think about it. They followed Jesus. They've been with him through his ministry. And yet, they didn't recognize him walking with them. But when we look at other resurrection accounts, we, we get some ideas about why they didn't recognize him. It seems that Jesus' body transformed after emerging from the tomb. There was something different about him. He was the same, yet different. Now remember, these two probably weren't part of the original 12 disciples because it, Luke tells us later, when they go back to Jerusalem, they see the 11 who are left. Christ had many disciples that we know very little about. Perhaps these two were part of that group. It's key, I think, that they didn't recognize Jesus until he broke bread with them at a meal. Think back to the first meal in the Bible. Do you know what that meal was? Any guesses? We'll see if you can share without a microphone. The very first, well, I'll tell you, the very first meal in the Bible was in Genesis. When the woman took the fruit, ate it, gave it to her husband, and he ate it. The very first meal in the Bible. And what's the result of that first meal of the Bible? Death, decay. The whole nature is transformed in a negative way because of that first meal. Now Christ, echoing that first meal, takes the bread, breaks it, blesses it, and gives it to them to eat. You see, in the, in the bread and the cup, that first meal is reversed. The death and decay that came to the earth because of that disobedience is reversed. And now we have life, resurrection, and hope for the future. He gave thanks, blessed that bread, broke it, gave it to them. Their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. They discover that that death is no longer the answer, that life and resurrection is possible. God's new creation is recognized by them and by us when we share in the bread and the cup. And Jesus is alive. We know that. We celebrate that. And not alive again like Jairus' daughter and Lazarus because they would eventually have to die again. Jesus has gone through death and come out on the other side into a new world still physical, but somehow transformed. And we are called to live into that life. We're invited to listen to Christ as we read the scriptures and as we travel through life, to have our hearts burning within us as fresh truth comes through reading and studying his word. We're invited to come together, sharing a common meal in what we call communion with one another, but also with Christ himself. John Wesley's mother had been a Christian for all her life, but it never became real to her until one time in the communion table, the words. She explained the words of, this is my body, this is my blood, struck through her heart, and I knew God for Christ's sake had forgiven me all my sins. There's something about that gathering together that opens the eyes of our heart, that allows us to live life with eyes wide open. 
Remember in scripture I read that after they recognized Jesus, he left them. But they didn't stay there. It said they hurried back to Jerusalem. They hurried back. They've just walked seven miles, and now they're hurrying back to Jerusalem. They've got something to share. Their eyes have been opened. Their mind is open. Their hearts are open. And they need to share what they've experienced with others. Now Luke tells us when they get there, the disciples are talking about what happened. They don't know what's going on. They're still blinded. They're still wondering, what's this woman's story all about? Is Jesus truly alive? And as these two get back to Jerusalem, to the disciples, they're talking about what happened. They share, and all of a sudden, Jesus appears to them. He comes into that room where they're meeting and begins to share with them. He's opening their spiritual eyes to reality. In verse 48, he said this, You are my witnesses. Finally, Jesus has given some final instructions to his witnesses. He tells them to be his witnesses. But I'm sure they're wondering how this is going to happen. What are they going to do? What's the future hold? And Jesus comforts them with this instruction. I'm sending the promise of my Father, a promise he has made in John 15, if you remember, when he told them that he would go out, but he would send another, just like him, to reveal truth and convict of sin. Jesus was speaking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would give them power to be witnesses. That promise was fulfilled in Pentecost. We read about it in Acts chapter 2. Jesus tells them to just wait. Wait until the Spirit comes and then be witnesses. I'm speaking to people, I'm sure, whose eyes are wide open, who have received Christ and are willing to speak for him, to be his witnesses. But you know, there's a lot of people in this world who are still spiritually blind. Their blindness is there. They don't know Christ. We are the witnesses. We are witnesses in a long line of witnesses down through the centuries who have experienced Christ and want to share him with others. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 talks about the source of blindness in our world. Here are his words from chapter 4. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry to be witnesses, we do not lose heart. Rather, we've renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. And here's the source. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel which displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. In other words, God has opened our eyes. And our mission is to help open the eyes of others. To help them see plainly. And help them see reality. It's an old but great story. Sherlock Holmes and his friend Dr. Watness went on a, Watson, Watson went on a camping trip. They set up their tent and fell asleep. Some hours later, Holmes woke up his faithful friend Watson. Look up. Look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replied, I see millions of stars. And what does that tell you? Holmes asked. Watson thought for a moment. Astronomically speaking, it tells me there are millions of galaxies with potentially millions of planets. Horologically, it, it says it's approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, it's evident that the Lord is all-powerful and we are small and insignificant. 
Meteorologically, it seems we'll have a beautiful day tomorrow. Then after a pause, Watson asked, well, Holmes, what does it tell you? Holmes was silent for a moment, and then he said, Watson, you imbecile. Somebody has stolen our tent. <laughs> Sometimes we think we see, but we don't see plainly. And our eyes are not wide open to the truth. It's only through the power of Christ working in us that we're able to get a glimpse of God and what God's salvation truly means to us. It's only when we open our hearts to Christ that the Bible becomes alive and real to us. And so when we open God's word, we pray for God's presence and his guidance. We pray that he opens the eyes of our hearts, of our minds, of who we truly are. And as we read, we listen for God's true insights. Only as we are aware that Christ is at our side, that we walk with him, that our hearts will burn within us and lead us to a point where we see him face to face. Our eyes will be wide open to who Christ is and what he offers to those whose eyes have not yet been opened. Those eyes are blinded by the God of this world. Again, you and I are witnesses to Christ. We are witnesses to the world around us, to those we know, to those we still don't know yet. We have seen. Our eyes are wide open so we can tell. So go. Go into your lives, your daily life. Go and tell with eyes wide open.